Hello everybody, this is Pramod Nair of the Department of English, University of Hyderabad. This lesson will focus on gender. The objective here is to look at gender studies with specific reference to feminism, concluding with a section on queer studies, to examine how gender functions as a critical lens through which we can view popular culture, cultural phenomena, the constructed nature of gender roles in society, and to examine how power structures determine cultural roles and stereotypes which we believe and assume are natural. Essentially, gender studies and feminist theory sees gender relations in literary and cultural texts as representing larger material conditions. What do we mean by this? What we mean is gender relations in cultural and literary texts reflect the unequal nature of power relations among the genders in real life. In other words, the literary and cultural representations of the relationship between men and women are reflections of concrete and unequal power structures that determine the roles men and women play in real life. Our first module by way of introduction is on the difference between sex and gender. Sex, like anatomy and physiology, is a biological phenomenon. It's to do with the nature of bodies, the functioning of bodies, the behavior of bodies. However, what's important to understand is that this biological condition of what constitutes our body is what we can think of as natural. Its meanings, however, are not natural. In other words, a biological condition is interpreted depending on the culture in which it is situated. This interpretation of a biological condition is what we call gender. Feminist studies and gender studies begins with this distinction between sex and gender, the biological phenomenon and the nature of corporeality, body, and the social construction of gender as a category. Mothering might be a biological condition. Mothering might be a biological feature of particular kinds of bodies, specifically female bodies. However, and this is important, the emphasis, the value, the significance of mothering has nothing to do with a biological fact. It is to do with how society expects women's bodies to be. In other words, the expectation of motherhood, the goal of motherhood, the significance of motherhood has nothing to do with a biological feature. It's to do with a cultural feature. In other words, what we are looking at is a distinction between sex and gender. Sexuality is a different issue. Please do not mix up sex with sexuality. We will come to that in a little bit. But what I want to get across here is that in gender studies, the biological fact of our lives, which is to do with our bodies and its functions, is not the determining feature of our lives. What determines it is the interpretive frame, the interpretations made by a particular culture or society. Um, how does then this interpretation happen? Well, look around you and, and look at our lives. How do we understand what we mean by masculine or feminine? How do we understand what the role is of a man or a woman? Families, textbooks, religion, school, the world around us, society, all of us come to us with a particular set of interpretations. In other words, we interpret biology in social terms, social terms that are cultural and specific. They are available to us in popular culture forms, in education, in religion, and the, what we call discourses around us. So what does gender as a cultural category achieve? First, gender naturalizes biological differences and it erases the cultural social construction of biological facts. It takes biological facts and presents it, all of them, I mean it includes anatomy, physiology, behavior, and so on, as automatically available to us. In fact, what gender ignores or tells us to ignore is that these are meanings attached to biological facts which have nothing to do with the biology in and of itself. Second, more importantly, it naturalizes the inequality between the genders. Gender construction as a social category makes it appear as though the inequality between male and female bodies is natural. In fact, it is not natural. It is to do with the economics of it, uh, 
it is to do with the cultural conditions in which we function, it is to do also with time frames. How did society expect women to behave in 16th century India is not the way we can see society behaving towards women in the 20th century. So, um, gender as social category ignores the very real economic basis for all these differences. In other words, gender naturalizes inequality and convinces us that the difference is preordained. It has been decided and determined beforehand. So, we need to get this very clear that the biological condition of being male or female has very little to do with the social construction of masculinity and femininity. Masculine and feminine are not biological. They are social categories, they are roles we all play. We play them because the world expects us to play them. We play them because we are convinced that is the way to be. Biology therefore gets reconstructed or reconstituted in culture. This essentially begins around the 1990s and under the influence of Marxism. It begins focusing on social conditions, specifically questions of labor, wage, political power, voting rights, welfare. The focus in materialist views of gender and sexuality and sex has to do with social labor economic political conditions in which the genders are placed. What do we mean by this? Think of the question of wages. Are men and women paid the same wage for the same kind of work they do? Historically that has not been the case. Historically speaking, women have been paid less for doing the same work as men do. For some strange reason it was believed that they deserve a lower wage. This has nothing to do with the biology. Let us recall what I have just said in the introduction on the social construction of gender. So, materialist feminism asks questions about economics, it asks questions about labor conditions, it asks what is the definition of work. Now here it is also important to understand a very significant move made by gender studies under the materialist critique. When we talk about economics, we generally think in terms of larger national level economics. When we think of labor, we think of industrial labor as in people who work in factories and large mechanized spaces. Materialist feminism asks us to pay attention to what it calls the domestic economy, the labor within a house. It asks us to think and consider whether the woman's work within the house deserves a wage. Think about this. We have never considered the work done by our mothers, wives, sisters or daughters as work. We think of it as something they do for the family as a whole unit. We do not think of it as something they work in fashion that people work in factories. The materialist critique of feminism refers to this as invisible labor because it is not deemed to be labor at all. We see materialist critiques therefore moving the subject of economy away from the factory which is public mass production spaces of mechanized labor into private spaces like the home, like domestic economies where the woman's work is not deemed to be work. Think about this, like I said, um, what do we say when we think about woman's work? Oh, she does it because that's what the woman does for the family. But don't you think that's work? Don't you think that's hard physical work? Do we think that cooking, cleaning the house, taking care of children is not work. Surely it is work. It involves the expenditure of physical energy. It requires planning. It requires a lot of things that we do not see at all. So invisible labor is what the woman's labor within the house becomes. And the materialist view of gender and society is very important for making that shift that we need to look at what the woman does not only outside her home but inside the home as well. And materialist critiques of gender suggest that this invisibilizing, this making labor invisible of women is responsible for unequal gender relations. It is always 
given more privilege when the male goes out and works and brings in the salary. The woman who stays at home and does the work is not deemed deserving of wage. So the unequal nature of work, the unequal definitions of work, what the man does outside the house is labor and work, what the woman does inside is not work. This unequal division of labor and the differential definitions of work is what characterizes unequal gender relations as well. So it's very important to understand this particular shift. Early in the 20th century, Virginia Woolf mourned the fact that women writers and artists are forced to use the language created for them by men. Why isn't there a woman's language was her question. Why isn't there a female language was her question. Interestingly, this question is taken up not necessarily by literary figures or professors of literature. They're taken up by philosopher critics like Helen Sisu, Luz Irigaray and Julia Kristeva, three of the very significant names in French feminism in the late half of the 20th century. Together and separately, they produced a theory of women's writing. In French, it's called L'Ecriture Feminine. L'Ecriture Feminine is typically translated as women's writing. So, L'Ecriture Feminine is the woman writing, literally. A very important quote which you need to think about as embodying this definition of L'Ecriture Feminine comes from Helen Sisu's 1976 essay, The Laugh of the Medusa where she wrote, and I'm quoting, woman must write herself, must write about women and bring women to writing, from which they have been driven away as violently as from their bodies. I'll quote that again for you. Woman must write herself, must write about women and bring women to writing, from which they have been driven away as violently as from their bodies. So philosophers and critics like Helen Sisu, Kristeva Irigare, practiced and theorized what they call Ecritude Feminine. And you see in the 80s and 90s, the fiction of Jeanette Winterson, Kathy Aker, Angela Carter and others trying to do the same thing. Angela Carter shifts between myth and reality, fable and the real in her fiction. It is partly autobiographical, partly fictional. Jeanette Winterson's work always borders on the autobiographical, but she fictionalizes her autobiography. This new language of women's writing is to do according to Ecriture Feminine, according to the theory of women's writing, slippery, leaky and fluid. It refuses to possess linearity as a feature. It refuses to follow logic and argumentation. It uses uh, parentheses, blank spaces. It denies logic, it denies objectivity. As Sisu and Irigare were to argue, the bodies of women are leaky, are fluid. Why should their writing be any different? What we see here is a major reversal of the very idea of writing. Writing we believe has to move from point one to point two in a logical way. We see a cause and effect sequence. We see a temporal sequence. This happened on the first day. This happened on the second day. And we think of that as a linear narrative. Now, the argument made by French feminists like Sisu is that bodies are not stable, logical and objective identities. They are not entities that are self-contained, closed and coherent. They are leaky, they are unstable, they are fluid, particularly women's bodies. So therefore, their writing should reflect this nature of women's bodies. In many cases, you begin to get the feeling that the so-called criticism is actually fiction, is actually fun, because it's dramatic, it's intense, it's slippery, it's unstable. Uh, if you have read any criticism, you will recognize this problem. We tend to think of criticism as something that requires a very clear, logical, objective narrative. This kind of narrative by Sisu and Irigari will not give you that. So here again you see that the law of form, the law of genre is being broken down. That women practicing écriture feminine will not write objective, serious academic prose. They write slippery, autobiographical, personalized prose. Much of this, of course, has its roots in post-structuralist thinking of Jacques Derrida and the psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, but that's not what I want to focus on. What I want you to see here is that the kind of writing practiced by Sisu 
in her fiction as well as non-fiction by Irigara in her philosophical tracks is an attempt to move away from the tyranny of form, from the oppressive nature of what they think as masculine male-centered language. The attempt is to discover a whole new way of talking, of writing. So this is a very important moment and we see this happening through the 80s and early 90s. I'm now going to be looking at race, gender and feminism. Thus far what we have looked at language and questions of race and gender, uh, of, of gender in the larger sense of society and materialist critiques has primarily to do with white societies. Around the mid 80s, critics who were African, African American and Asian began to wonder whether their experiences, their stories are being captured effectively in the kind of feminism produced by Western white women academics. They argued that gender studies has consistently ignored the race angle, the racial angle. Their question was a simple one. Is the white woman professor in a metropolitan, wealthy, elite university like Stanford or Harvard the same in material terms as a woman, say, in interior Madhya Pradesh in India? Are the conditions of the women of untouchable castes, so-called untouchable castes in India, the same as white women politicians or businesswomen in the West? Their answer was clearly no. So black feminism, which comes to the forefront in the 1980s and early 90s, asks that race also be included as a category when studying gender, giving rise to a movement called black feminism the critics argued that we cannot ignore that fact, the social condition and the material condition that black women are doubly marginalized and doubly oppressed, not only because they are women, but also because they are black. So black feminism calls attention to the material lives of black women, which includes questions of labor, wage, employment, or political rights. It looks at the patriarchal nature of black society, families and traditions. It also looks at the sisterhood of black women, the communities of, of women, and also asks us to pay attention to questions of sexual difference and sexual orientation among black women. That was about blacks and African Americans. We now have a category called post-colonial feminism which emerges roughly around the late 1990s and has to do with the presence of a large number of Asian American academics in Western academia. The question being asked here is, white feminism, black feminism are race centered. They're centered around white women and black women. What about Asian American women? What about brown women? What about women in India? What about, in our case, in India's case, Dalit women, tribal women? Much of post-colonial feminism, therefore, emphasizes cultural differences. What they are addressing here is a very simple commonsensical question. Aren't there cultural differences and material differences among women in India? Can we say professional women, women officers, women academics, women uh, entrepreneurs in, say, Bombay are the same in terms of economic, political and social independence and prestige as a tribal woman, as a Dalit woman? The answer is very clearly no. You cannot say they are all simply just women. The cultural differences among women, the political and economic differentials among women must be accounted for. This is where post-colonial feminism makes its presence felt. Post-colonial feminism therefore is worried that the cultural differences among women are being erased that when we speak about women, we think of a universal category, just the woman. In fact, there is no such thing as a universal woman. What we have are different kinds of women, black, Asian, and so on. We also need to add things like disabled women, 
women of other castes and communities, minoritarian women. This ignoring of differences in very real material conditions is what they are offended by. The process of homogenization, as we can call it, standardizes all experiences. It ignores the fact that women all over the world have very different experiences of puberty, sexuality, marriage, death, family, employment. And to think of a unified feminist movement is to ignore these very real lived differences. Finally, post-colonial feminism argues that we need to account for different belief systems. What do we mean by this? See, traditionally, white feminism has been pro-science and anti-religion and anti-spiritualism. That is to do with their foundation in Marxist thought, which does not accept religion as a category of analysis at all. Postcolonial feminism, however, argues that for several women, say in India, religion is an important feature of their lives. Spirituality and spiritualism are important features of their lives. Belief systems are crucial to how they see themselves, their identities. And therefore, to not take into account spirituality is to ignore a very important feature of their lives. As a result, postcolonial feminism seeks very hard to retrieve the spiritual as a central component of women's identity in third world countries. And this is a very important point and a very important shift. Think of a phrase like mother nature. What do we mean by that? What the term implies is that nature functions as a mother to all human beings. However, do we stop to think what the implications are? Mother nature is a term where nature is converted into a woman who nurtures us, who takes care of us, who makes sacrifices on behalf of us. Ecofeminism begins with a very simple proposition or assumption. When you use a phrase like mother nature, you do two things. You naturalize the woman and you feminize nature. In both cases, what you see is that women and nature are available for exploitation, are expected to make sacrifices, and they both come under the domination of the male. Woman's body, nature's body. Women as a community, nature as a landscape, are both meant for domination, subjugation, and exploitation. So, Ecofeminism proposes that to think of nature as a woman is to actually do two very tough, unpleasant and oppressive things. It makes an excuse for the exploitation of women and nature by men, saying they are anyway available for us to benefit from. Two, it takes away any power or agency the woman or nature might have. It converts traditional patriarchy converts mother earth, nature, woman, wife, sister, plant life into objects without agency. Objects to be exploited, to be taken away as and men choose to do so. It is also of course possible that we can think of protection as something men offer towards women and nature. Now, materialist ecofeminism, which is a component under um, ecofeminism argues that there needs to be a greater equality in labor distribution and the recognition of the contribution of women's work, which would result, of course, in better wages for women. And it must end the masculine exploitation of nature. A second strand within ecofeminism is spiritual ecofeminism, which retrieves older myths and religious beliefs about nature. What does this imply? It implies very simply that nature has a certain amount of power which you need to respect. Nature has authority which you need to be in awe of and which you must again, like I said, respect. It is also important to understand that spiritual ecofeminism calls for a greater integration or harmony between human life and the world around us, what biologists and environmentalists will think of as ecosystems.
So to ignore the spiritual dimension of our relationship with nature is to make it very clear that there is masculine domination of women and nature. So ecofeminism has gained strength primarily because it calls for an end to science as well or old fashioned science which has been deemed to be masculine. That science attempt and you can think of Mary Shelley's great novel Frankenstein which starts this process. Science seeks to dominate nature, not work with nature but work over nature, to control nature and that's the same way in which patriarchy functions in order to control women. Queer studies, as it's called as a large category, looks at the history of cultural representations of the gay or lesbian as deviant, sick or criminal. It foregrounds sexuality and sexual preferences as an important category of critical analysis when dealing with literary and cultural texts. Let's go back to what I began with, that sex is biological and gender is cultural and political. So in the case of queer studies, the queer, the lesbian or gay, is frequently described as criminal or sick not because of their biology but because that particular social system, social order or culture defines it as criminal or sick. So queer theory or queer studies is a political approach and it calls for equal rights for lesbian and gay writers as well. It also proposes and you will recall here the argument made by black feminism and postcolonial feminism that when we think of sexuality we think only of heterosexuality. Adrian Rich, the poet and critical thinker, referred to it as compulsory heterosexuality, where we do not think of any other kind of sexuality at all. In other words, we have one norm. It's called a normative in critical terms. We have a norm. We assume that is normal. People who don't fit the heterosexual paradigm are therefore referred to as abnormal, sick or deviant. Queer studies looks at the general construction of sexuality in discourses of medicine, law or religion. It looks at the popular representations of the gay or lesbian in films, soap operas, comics, etc. Very importantly, it looks at the institutional structures within which sexuality is embedded. By institutional structures, we think of the family, the law court, medicine and other places which offer definitions of normal sexuality, which offer criteria by which to judge sexuality and which therefore influence our perceptions of these. It looks at the history of homosexual writing and representation which has usually been absent from traditional literary histories. It also explores the link between sexuality based oppression and other discriminatory forms such as patriarchy and racism. So let me quickly now wind up by looking at a brief summary of what we have been talking about. Gender studies looks at the unequal nature of power relations among genders in material conditions of life in any society. It looks at the popular representations of these in literary and cultural texts and argues that the representations in these texts actually reflect the very real material conditions of gender inequality. Gender studies opens with the biological category of sex and the social category of gender. It argues that biological facts and features have nothing to do with their social expectations because those meanings are imposed upon them by society. The biological fact of mothering for instance is interpreted and given value and meaning by society not as an, an essential feature of the biological fact. Materialist feminism asks us to look at questions of labor, wage, equality of rights in social order, in political domains and asks us to make a shift from looking at labor within the industrial situation to domestic economies. Ecofeminism focused on the conversion of, on the equation of nature with women and argues that it has facilitated the exploitation of both women and nature. Within the domain of the purely literary, questions of women and language have exercised the imagination and arguments of, sharpened arguments of people like Virginia Woolf and French feminism developed the concept of écriture féminine which speaks about women writing in particular ways to capture the nature of their bodies within writing itself. Finally, in the case of queer studies, we looked at questions of the 
other forms of sexuality as being outside the pale of normal sexuality and normal here in this case is the subject of critique. When race and gender are equated and brought into the same critical lens, we have seen the rise of black feminism and postcolonial feminism, which argues that unless we figure race into the picture, we are going to be ignoring the lived realities of men uh, and women in different parts of the world who belong to different cultures. That's all for now. Thank you.